welcome world. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Round two, welcome world. Larson Training Centers. This is our weekly memory. <laughs> Cut. 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 Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Three. Welcome world. Here we are once again, another week at Larson Training Centers for our memorization recital. And uh, this week we have Marcellus as the director and Sequoia as the, what do we call Sequoia? What is that position? <laughs> Assistant director. Assistant director, okay, good, perfect. And I'm the set manager. And Safir is the set manager. <laughs> Emmanuel is going to be doing Two. And Brett's the makeup artist. And Brett is the makeup artist. <laughs> and what did I say? <laughs> okay. Now, who is going to go first? I will. Okay. How many it's a compliment. Total? Robert is going first. How many people yeah. total, uh, director? So we can kind of know how to. How do many it. people are doing theirs? I'm going to go first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Enough, huh? Rashawn has already done it. Anthony's done. Billy, 13. Or Eric, 14. Okay. Rashawn already did it. Oh. No, Rashawn. Oh, Krishan. Right. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Robert McLean. I'm my third week here at Larson Training Center. I'm going to be doing two poems today. The first is Peepa Song. The years in the spring, the days in the morn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides do pearl. The lark's on the wing, the snail's on the thorn. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. And the second one I'm going to do today is A Smile. Let others cheer the winning man. There's one I hold worthwhile. Tis he who does the best he can then loses with a smile. Beat me is, but not to stay. Down with the rank and file. That man will win some other day who loses with a smile. All right. All right, awesome. <clears throat> <laughs> Quiet on the set. Three. Fred George and I'll be reciting Little Jack Horner. Mm -hmm. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie. He stuck in his stomach and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I. I'm be doing... I'm going to be doing the tiger today. Tiger. I've decided. Quiet on the set. Three. Hello, my name is Michael, and I'm going to be reciting one of my favorite poems from the Remember This Book, The Tiger. Wow. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. In the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? I heard you doing all that drone. <laughs> he said nailed it again. <laughs> I think he said again. He is rich. 
tried to do it. Jabber one. Jabber one. He was even <laughs> Stupid. Quiet on the set. Three. I'm Dan Dempsey, week six. I'll be doing Jabber Walkie today. Twas Brillick and the Slithy Toes did Gyre and Gimble in the wave. All Mimsy were the borrow crows and the mom rats out brave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird that shun, the friendless bander snatch. He took his vorpal sword and hat, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while of thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whipping through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galloping back. And has thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to me, my beamish boy. O oh, fragilous day, Kalu Kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the, with the slithy toes, did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy where the bar grows, and the mom rats outgrave. <laughs> Oh, that pause was on purpose. What you doing, Dave? Not yet, yet. Okay. I'm yeah. just going to turn the air conditioner up. Oh, it's on already. It's, right it's, it's chilly in here. No, it's. Oh, no. I'm out here. I'll go do it right there. Okay. I'll be ready. Which one do you go? The Gettysburg address. Knock him out, knock him out. I need it right quick. No, you need not need it. Was Brillick and the Slide Quiet on the set. Three. Okay. Three. 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 Good afternoon, I'm William Engel, and I'm gonna do the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who have, who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to where to detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be here, to be dedicated here to the, to be dedicated here to the, Unfinished. I'm finished. I'm finished. I can't hear. I'm finished. To be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That this nation, under God, no, that we here highly resolve, cut, I got to do it. No cut. Come on, that was terrible. Really? You was doing a good job. Doing good. Doing good. Yeah, it was almost at the end. Can we do it again? Yeah. Quiet on the set. Three. 
Hi, I'm William Engel, and I'm going to do the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a part of, portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, Cannot. But in a larger sense, we cannot desecrate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but they can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be here dedicated, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which those who fought here, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. that this nation under God shall have a new burst of freedom, a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Don oh, Sleet. Okay. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Don Sleet. I'm going to recite the, uh, the Purple Cow. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But anyhow, quiet on the set. Three. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Go, 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 go. Good job. And I'd like to, uh, to read The Road Not Taken. This was written by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down, one as far as I could to where it bent into the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no steep had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way. I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Some are ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, Donald, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Bravo! Good job. Next.
Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, Great man. Uh, page 23. Quiet on the set. Three. Uh, great man. Not gold, but only man can make a people great and strong. Men who, for truth and honor's sake, stand fast and suffer long. Brave men who work while others sleep, who dare while others fly. They build a nation's pillars deep and lift them to the sky. All right. Joe, are you on track? Have you done all of your all of my memorization? Are you on track for the uh, award? No, 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 I think so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you should. Chair walking. Chair walking. You get $100,000. <laughs> 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 in a Ferrari. It's the Something Israel and Something Award for memorizing each poem. You get Chromebook, dude. Um, Twenty-one. Yeah. All right. Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Three. Hello, I'm Lent Clark. Today I'll be reading Jabberwocky. Yes. Twas brillig and slithy trows. Did cry and grimble in the wild. All mimsy were the burrow groves, and the moans rather outgrave. Beware the jabberwocky, my son. The jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jab, jab bird, and shun the firmus bandersnatch. He took a verbal sword in hand. Long time the monoxum foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as if a fish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came with him through the toogly wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the verbal blade went snicker snack. The left, he left it dead, and with its head he went galloping back. And hast thou slain the jobber walk? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, fabulous day, Kahu Kale, he jarled in his joy. Twas brilliant and slithery troves, did cry and gimble in the wall. All mimsy were the burrow grows, and the moon rather outgrow. Yeah. Next. Next. Dave. Sure. Okay, I can get it. Uh, we're not need yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's who's got the camera? Right here. Part way through. I'm gonna move over to the big screen. Okay. Part way through. Part way through. He did say part way through. Not yet. Part way through. I mean, oh, yeah. Yes. Hold on. Director. Send me an invite. Keep speaking. And I can just go. Oh, hi. How are you? Yes, yes. 
Um, eventually, we're interested in writing a story. And I want to try to set an appointment and have an editor come out and speak with you or whoever you deem necessary. One word? Yeah. Um, it's going to be about uh, your company for the magazine, the Vulture Magazine, the Italian American Magazine here in the world. It's the Vulture L A capital B O C D. Okay. Okay, we're taking a slight break in this. <laughs> now, Brett wants to get his thing online. It was like Mario when you did that. Mario. Okay, so do you have to turn on your camera? I will not show you one here. One more time. There it goes. Okay. Show it there. I don't see one here. There you go. Yep. Okay, Dave. All right, are we ready? Because this is um, causing my predictions that when. <laughs> I won't let Jake do it. I'll let you check. Yeah, I got Can you see yourself, Dave? Wait with yourself. I'll drink to myself. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. We'll make you two bucks. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi there. My name is Dave Sweetland <laughs> from Larson Training Center here in Las Vegas. And I'll be reciting a poem today by Edgar Guest. Uh, it's called The Things That Haven't Been Done Before. But let me make a little preface to this. There's a line, actually, uh, a phrase in this poem about Christopher Columbus, and I would like to read a little part of a children's book about Mr. Columbus. It'll relate directly to the poem. <clears throat> Tension among the crew rose after the third week in open waters. By now, they had been out of sight of land for longer than any known person. This was a, truly a feat in seagoing history. Fearing certain death, the men plotted to murder Columbus, take over the vessel, and return to Spain. Only a passionate speech delivered uh, by Columbus's uh, first-in-command uh, saved the day. There was a line in the poem, or in the story, that went, Adelante, Adelante, onward, onward. And the expedition continued. Today, if I was working with my Chicano braceros, they might say, chingale, chingale, pendejo. <laughs> <laughs> There goes the G -rating. The things that haven't been done before, those are the things to try. Columbus dreamed of a distant shore on the rim of a far-flung sky. His faith was bold, his blood, his, his heart was bold, and his faith was strong. No, I'll keep working on it. Mm, Columbus dreamed of an unknown shore at the room of a far-flung sky. And his heart was bold, and his faith was strong, and he ventured in dangers new. He paid no heed to the jeering crowd or the fears of the doubting crew. The many will follow the beaten path, 
with guideposts on the way. They live and have lived for ages back with a chart for every day. The many will, someone has told them it's safe to go on the road he has traveled o'er, and all that they ever strive to know are the things that were known before. A few strike yeah. out without map or chart. As Mr. Yeah, Bilbo did. Camera, keeps disconnecting. Where never a man has been. From the beaten paths they draw apart to see what no man has seen. There are deeds they hunger alone to do, though battered and bruised and sore. They blaze the path for the many who do nothing not done before. The things that haven't been done before are the task worthwhile even today. Are you one of the flock that follows? Or are you one that shall lead the way? Are you one of the timid souls that quail at the jeers of a doubting crew? Or dare you, whether you win or fail, strike out for the goal that is new? All right. I can't take your move. Oh, okay. Next. Okay, well, thank you. Next. Next. Okay, so we have Eric, Billy, Sequoia. Okay, Billy, Billy. Oh, 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 people saw. People saw. <laughs> What's that, my name? The director. Slide over a little bit more. Why do you keep saying my name? No, I'm not going to one of these fellows right here said my name. That was the director. Besides the director. Besides the director. Director. Quiet on the set. Three. Hello, my name's Billy. Uh, it's my third week. I'm going to be doing People's Song. The year's in the spring. The day's in the morn. Morning's at seven. The hillsides do pearl. <clears throat> Uh, the lark's on the wing, the sn snail's on the thorn, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. All right. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Eric, and um, I'm going to be reciting the 23rd Psalm. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He, he, make, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth, leadeth me beside still waters. He, rest he restores my strength. He let leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear, fear no evil. His rod and thy staff comfort me. He cut. Okay. Cut. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Should I start again? Or just yeah. Quiet on the set. Three. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth, leadeth me by the still waters. He restores my, my strength. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. His rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before my enemies. My cup runneth over. He anointeth my head with oil. Cut. You, 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 you drop the lines. Oh, you gosh. <laughs> you <jumping> lines. <laughs> Listen, read it, bro. Quiet on the set. Three. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil throughout with me. I ride in thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup, cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall be with me for the rest of for the rest of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. It's all right, we'll do it. I did too. Next. Okay, so we've got Sequoia, Krishana, Joseph. Holding up progress, Sequoia. I'm holding, I'm out, I'm out the Krishana. I'm out the Krishana. This is the director. We want our check. No, I'm the manager. I am the manager. But I am making the money. For the make up artist. For the make up artist. Do something like that. Which one you doing, sir? That's not so much. That's Krishana. Are you homie? Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Excuse me. Three. Hi, my name is Krishana Fields. I'm on week five, I think. And I'm going to be doing the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh, you don't go fast against one. Come on, What's the most special? You gonna get fired? Why? She's too slow. We losing money, fans. Okay. Right. Sabir, it's got the count. Bad employee hat skills. <laughs> oh. Quiet on the set. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sequoia Lewis. I'll be reciting Smile. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> She smiled. <laughs> she smiled. Don't be that. You can't laugh. Cut. Right. That's not part of the act. You ready? You want the book? <laughs> I can take a seat and calm you This is not fair. Cut. Come on, Cindy Trey. Wasn't like. You got this. Boy. Would y'all stop playing so I can no. just do this? Come on. Come on. Give me the camera. I had to do it. Get up there. Brett, don't do me, okay? Go. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Three, two. Hi, my name is Sequoia Lewis. I'll be reciting Smile. Let the others cheer the winning man. There is one I hold worthwhile. Tis he who does the best he can, then loses with a smile. Being he is, but, um, but but not to stay down, down with the rank and file. A man will win some other day with, lo with losing with a smile. Yes. Yes. Next. I have it, but I just hate when y'all look at me. I've been saying this all day. I got this. Okay. Are you in red wheelbarrow? I'm doing a. I'm doing a. Gillette. Bruce, what's his name? Burgess. Burgess. Yeah. The red wheelbarrow? Uh, this is the perfect path. Okay. Good start. I want to leave mine over again. I want to leave this one over again. Here we go. Hi. Uh, Hi. Cut. 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 <laughs> <laughs> He's ready. I wish I could do what he just did. <laughs> <laughs> 
Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Joseph Hayward here at Clarkson Learning Center. Um, I'm going to recite the purple cow. Oh, I've never seen a purple cow. Don't want to see one. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet on the set. Three. Okay. My name is Joseph Hayward. I'm going to recite the purple cow. I've never seen a purple cow. I never hope. Give me one second. <laughs> Here you go. Good. Yeah, there you go. Never seen a purple cow. Uh, I'm ready now. I'm sorry about that. No, man. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Joseph Hayward. I'm going to recite the purple cow. Okay. I've never seen a purple cow. Never hope to see one. But I can tell you this. I'd rather see one. <laughs> okay. yeah. but, I can tell, but I can tell you anyhow. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Joseph. I'm going to recite the purple cow. Hey, I never seen a purple cow. Never hope to see one. Anyhow, I can't tell you this. <laughs> but I can tell you anyhow. <laughs> I can tell you anyhow. But I can tell you anyhow. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, my name is Joseph. I'm going to recite the purple cow. I've never seen a purple cow. I hope to never see one. Anyhow, I hope to see one, then be one. <laughs> 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 I'd rather see you than be one. Just read it. Just read it, bro. Just read it. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Hi, Three. my name is. Uh, Three. Hi, my name is Joseph. I never saw a purple cow. I never hope to see one, but I can tell you, anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Come on, you going back up here? Come on, man. <laughs> Bring that leg down a little bit. Now we're gonna get that I will. Um, That's no, too much. Yeah. It's not that one anymore. That's one. Yeah. Quiet on the set. How's that? Which is better, standing or sitting? Standing. Standing. Yeah. Quiet on the set. Three. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, Larson Training Center here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, it's our Friday poem recitation. And uh, today I'm going to be doing two poems. But I, I wanted to say something, you know, perhaps everyone is wondering, you know, where do we get our repertoire from? Uh, the poems that we do are uh, an extraction from all of the poems that were uh, composed by many great poets over the period of time. Uh, and, you know, we do them because they are wonderful poems and that they mean a lot to the students in the school. So uh, today I'm uh, uh, kind of pleased and honored to be doing two Shakespearean classics, the first of which will be Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take up arms against a, multi against a sea of troubles and by offending end them to die, to sleep, no more. And by asleep, we, to say, we end the heartache, the thousand tr natural troubled shock that flesh is heir to. Tis consummation that is devoutly to, to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the, there's the respect 
that makes a calamity so of so long life. For who would bear to suffer the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the laws delayed, the insolence of office, and the, and the spurs that patient merit to the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who does fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the something, but that of the something after death. But the dread. But the dread of something after death. The undiscovered country for whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear the ills we have. Uh, uh, then fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue resolution is sicklied over with or with a pale cast of thought and enterprises with great pitch and moment. With this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name action. Soft you now, soft, soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph in thy horizons, be all my sins remembered. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and the second classic I would like to try to do is a considerably more difficult one. Uh, this one is called the Feast of uh, the St. Crispian's Day Speech. <sighs> if we are marked to die, we are an hour to do our country loss. And if live, the fewer men, the greater the share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It earns me not if men my garments wear, but if it is a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cuz, wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great of honor. As one man more, methinks, would share from me. Uh, right. Rather pro proclaim it, Westmoreland, through that my, my host, that he which have no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company who fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. And he, sh who, he that outlives this day and shall come safe home, shall stand a tiptoe when this day is named. And he who shall see this day and live old age will yearly on to vigil feast his neighbors and say, Saint, tomorrow is St. Crispian's day. Then he shall tear his sleeve and show his scars and say, uh, I, uh, these, these wounds I, I had on Crispian day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantage <coughs> what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisburg and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups forever remembered. And this story shall the good man tell his son. And Crispian, and Crispian, Crispian shall ne'er go by this day until the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For here today, this to today, that this for here today, the man that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be be near so vile. This day shall comfort shall gentle his condition, and the gentleman in England. A bit a, 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 no. now a bed shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks who fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, the right one. We've got someone before you. That's all good. <laughs> okay, you know, you special, our new student person. <clears throat> Red wheelbarrow. It's my turn. Quiet on the set. Three. Hello. My name is Edward Bevelacqua the third. Cut. Quiet on the set. Three. Hello, I am the third Edward Bevilacqua, and I will be presenting Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky. <laughs> Twas brillig, and the slithy toads did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the momraffs outgrabe. Beware of the Jabberwock, my son, with jaws that bite and, j and claws that catch. Beware of the Jub Jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the mansome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as an oofish thought he stood, the Jabberwocky, with eyes of flame, came whiffing through the tolgy woods and burbled as he came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snickersnack. He left it dead, and with his head, he went galoomphing back. <coughs> and hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, joyous day, Kalu Kalei, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the slithy toads, the gyre and gimbal in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mom wraths out grave. Got one question for you, though. What brings you here today to visit your grandpa? <laughs> well, uh, I am a I am a student here. I've been uh, I've been a student here for all of uh, well all of my life actually. So thought yeah, I'd come up and so. share share my interpretation. <laughs> Thank you very much. You said your grandpa. <laughs> I asked him, what brings you here to visit your grandpa today? <laughs> <laughs> what you mean? More deadly. Okay. Yeah. The page 127. 127. 110. 110. Quiet on the set. Oh, before y'all start. Hey, give me like five seconds if I mess up or whatever it is. Say, I'm thinking of it at the same time or whatever, okay. stuff like that. Before we say cut? No. No, before, before you, you know, say, uh, say the word or whatever and stuff like that. Let him work through it. Let him work through it. Gather himself. And okay, continue. we got you. Okay, they got it. Quiet on the set. <clears throat> Three. My name is Infalme Damu Moja Odi. Infalme mean king, Damu mean blood, and Moja mean one. The summary of my name is the king of kings who shed his blood for one people. Today I will be reciting Mark Anthony's speech by William Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good that is in the good is interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously have Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
He have brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar have wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on a looper call. I thrice presented him with a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I speak what I do know. You all did love him once. Once. What is it? But all, you all did love him once. Yeah, what is it? What's the next word? Not without. Oh, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment. Thou art fled to Brutus' beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin here with Caesar, and I must take pause till it come back to me. But yesterday, the words of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I'd rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. Be here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory. And dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. Have patience, my friends. I must know read it. It is not meat, you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what will come of it? Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it, to tell you that. I fear I wrong the honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. Twas on a summer's evening in his tent that day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his curse still away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so kindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all, for when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms quite bankers him, then burst his mighty heart. Versus mantle. What? Oh yeah, yeah, and in his mantle, muffling up, and in his mantle, muffling up in his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dent of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here, here's himself, marred as you see, with traitors. 
good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have. Alas, I know not that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts, but as you know me all, a plain blunt man that loved my friend, and that they know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, that were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise in mutiny. <laughs> okay, so we so that was uh that was great. Odie, you did a great job. Thank you. Now, what was going on in that in that uh he's giving eulogy? A, he's giving a, a speech about but he's easier to die and he was giving on his heart, you know. Well he was making people. sure he didn't get killed by the Romans, so at first he needed to praise Caesar, but towards the end of it he was Okay. So, okay. So, who was Caesar? The emperor of Rome. No, he wasn't the emperor. He was a king. He wasn't a king. He was one of the first triumvirate. What, what did you say? Was he a gladiator? No. Caesar, Caesar Julius Caesar, was one of the greatest men in the history of the world. Unfortunately, because of the way he died and how history is written, for a long, long time, he was considered bad. But he came from a, an old family, but he didn't have any money. He uh, married young, but he had to get a divorce because back in Rome, you married for more political reasons than love. So somebody who was more influential, older, said, I want your wife. Mm -hmm. So he had to divorce her. He got uh, kidnapped when he was young. Kidnapping was a big thing back then. And he got held uh, for ransom. And he said to the guys, you better let me go because if I get ransomed, I'm going to come back and kill all of you. He got ransomed and then he did do that. He went back after the guys that kidnapped him and killed him. He was pretty well educated. He is known as the second greatest attorney in Roman history. Who was number one? Cicero. Cicero was number one, and they lived at the same time. And Cicero took sides against Caesar when they first plotted to kill him. So he rose up through the ranks, and then he had to be in the army a long time. And he was a good soldier, and he was a good writer. And they said, well, we can't really kill him because he's just, you know, 25, 30 years old. We can't just kill him. Let's send him to Gaul, France, and, and lead the army there. So he fought in Gaul, Gaul for 10 years. He killed everybody in Gaul. He was the first person, first uh, Roman to, to go to Britain. Yes? That movie that, uh, was it a movie uh, made of him? A lot, but there was a TV show called Rome. Mm -hmm. That was about him. So he landed on the shores of Great Britain, came back. He went to Germany, and there's this big river that separated the Roman Empire, not the Empire, but the Roman Republic from the barbarians. And he, and the barbarians would take boats across and they would raid the Romans, they would raid Roman territory. And he built, he had the, his army build a bridge across the river. Nobody had ever done that before. And so on the far banks, on the German side, the Germans would come out and watch them building this bridge across this big, wide, deep river. And for them, it was like going to the, the, the show. It was like, wow, we can't, 
we can't believe this. So once he built the ridge, river, he marched his army across and said, okay, now what? Who's gonna, who's, gonna, who's gonna stand up to us now? Because when there's a river dividing the Germans from the Romans, it was easy for the Germans to say, we're bad. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but when this bridge got built and the Roman army marched across, all of a sudden they disappeared. So the Romans crossed back over the bridge and they tore the bridge down be behind them. And they said, we can come back anytime we want. You guys can never come over. We can come back whenever we want. Then there was another thing where finally all of the Gauls were against the Romans. Uh, Vitagorix was the head of all of the Gauls, and he had an army of about 100,000 people. And he went up on this mountain, and the Romans did what they had done before. The Romans were good at siege warfare. And so they built a wall around this hill where Vitagorix was. But Vitagorix was able to get another 50,000 or 100,000 Gauls to come down on Caesar. So before that, though, a siege is you kind of want to starve the other guys out. Okay, they're, they're inside their fort. You build a wall around them, they can't come out, and you just starve them. Well, you're kind of starving, too. The Romans were kind of starving, too. So it was getting down to who was going to starve first. Except then the uh, reinforcements for Vitagorix's army came. So what Caesar had to do is he had to build another wall around himself to keep the other Gauls away. And then there was a big battle. The Romans won, though they were outnumbered. They took Vitagorix captive, and uh, they brought him back to Rome, and they killed him. Meanwhile, he's writing a book. So he's riding on his horse, dictating, and he has two scribes riding along with him, taking notes, because he's writing this book called The Gallic Wars. And this was the first um, uh, book where you keep sending back, kind of like a TV show, where you send back a new thing. There's a new episode every month. So for many years, he'd send back another chapter and another chapter, and the people of Rome, the people of Rome, liked Caesar because they liked hearing what he was doing. The Senate was not happy because he's becoming very rich, very powerful, and very popular. And he was on the side of the people. Remember before I'd said the Senate said, why give the stuff to the soldiers? We can just keep it. If they go out and conquer, we'll keep it. So Caesar wasn't obeying what they wanted. So they said, okay, you need to come back to Rome. And they were going to try him for treason. So in Rome, they had a law, you can't bring your army across the Rubicon, which is in northern Italy. You can't bring your army across the Rubicon River. So he knew if he didn't bring his army, what would happen? They'd try him for treason and they'd convict him and kill him. If he brought his army, what happens? He broke the law and now they can't kill him. They could declare war. So they got Pompey, who was the richest guy in Rome, to, to represent the Senate. And there was a civil war between Caesar and the Senate. Pompey was the general for the, for the, for, uh, for the Senate. So as he crossed the river, he had a very famous expression, which should be in your books. Or actually, I think it might be a, a picture of a die. So that you should remember this and use it whenever, whenever it's practical. Alia e acta est means the die is cast. So the guy said, "Well, we've crossed the Rubicon. We've, we've crossed the Rubicon. We're now criminals." And Caesar said, "Well, alia e acta est. The die is cast. We'll see what happens now, because we're either going to die or we're going to not die. We're going to win." So they went back and they got in a civil war with Pompey. They chased Pompey around. They went over. Pompey escaped to Greece, was well fortified. Caesar went over there. Pompey 
um, there's a final battle where Caesar's people are starving. Once again, Pompey's guys are okay. And they're saying to Pompey, look, Caesar's on the run. He's, he doesn't have his reinforcements. Big ships were coming over, supplies were coming over, a storm, the ships got wiped out. So Caesar and his army was kind of in bad shape. So they came to this, uh, so the guys said to Pompey, Brutus, Cassius, all of those guys said to Pompey, we don't need to attack Caesar. We don't need to attack him. Let's just let him starve or surrender. We don't need to attack. And Pompey, his ego got to him and said, well, what glory is there in that? We can't go back to Rome saying we defeated Caesar by starving him out. We can't lose. We're going to go ahead. So like in Manuel's second one, the St. Crispin speech, the English were outnumbered and outmatched by the French, but they fought anyway. So in Caesar, so the Pompey's people are thinking, we've got this thing. These guys are out there starving. They're eating rats. They're eating anything they can, anything they can find. We're nice here. We're warm. We're dry. We're well fed. We outnumber them. In Caesar's tent, the guy says to Caesar, maybe we should talk about terms of surrender. Maybe they'll let you live and just go back to, to Gaul somewhere. And he said, no, why? we have the advantage. We have the advantage. Because our people know if we fight, we have to win or we die. They have other choices. <laughs> they don't have to fight. They cannot. So we have an advantage here because we are fighting to the death. They're not. And that's a lesson for military history today of how small countries like Vietnam can do so much damage or put so much fear into the United States of we have more choices. For them, it's do or die. Caesar won. Afterwards, when the press is out there interviewing Caesar, when CNN is out there interviewing him, <laughs> and they say, well, what happened today? He said, well, if the other side had a better general, they would have won. And that's so. Caesar goes back. Pompey ultimately gets killed. He goes to Egypt thinking that he's got reinforcements there. The Egyptians kill Pompey and say to Caesar, we killed him. Caesar was indignant. How dare you kill a consul of Rome? So he went and took control of Egypt. <laughs> he goes back to Rome, and then he married uh, Cleopatra and had some kids. But uh, he goes back to Rome, and he forgives all of the guys, including C Cicero, who plotted against him. And they said, Caesar, how can you do this? These guys wanted to have you killed. He said, well, they have to be true to their nature as I will be true to mine. I don't do that. Caesar doesn't do that. Well, in hindsight, he should have because round two <laughs> was Odie's, the oratory of Odie's speech. So four years later, they kill him. He's In the meantime, he's trying to enact legislation for the poor, the people, taking away stuff from the Senate. He implemented a new calendar called the Julian calendar. What is our calendar called today? What's the official name of our calendar? The Gregorian. The Gregorian calendar. And when did that come out? Uh, 1505. Okay, so about 1500 years later. And the Julian calendar was the calendar that was before that. It was basically the same calendar, except it was off by one quarter of a day every century or something like that some ridiculous number so when the gregorian calendar came into effect it, the uh, julian calendar that the dates had to be adjusted by about 78 days in 1500 years that was the thing that caesar did so he was a great writer great uh, attorney uh, fearless guy smart humble he did like to have affairs with the wives of his generals, though. <laughs> so, so that wasn't so good. It was the guy I got him doing, huh? Yeah. So, 
And then one day they decided they were going to kill him. Well, they didn't. One, it wasn't one day. They plotted to kill him. They did things so his bodyguards weren't there, and Mark Antony wasn't there. And um, so Brutus and the other guys all got together and they killed him in the Senate House. So you had senators actually going up to him and stabbing him and killing him. And it was, we all have to do this. It's kind of like in prison. Okay, we all jump in. If you don't jump in, if you don't get that guy, we get you. That's how it was in the Senate. If you don't stab Caesar, we stab you. So you choose which way you want to go. You're with us or you're against us. So uh, then they have the, So the people of Rome are, they don't know what the hell's going on here. Because the Senate is saying, we killed the dictator. We killed him, the tyrant, we killed him. And they weren't getting much support because the people liked Caesar. Back then in Rome, you could not slander people. Slander was the biggest crime. They didn't really have free speech like we know. So here in this country with free speech, you can pretty much say anything you want about somebody. In Roman times, you couldn't say any, you couldn't say bad things. So the reason in Mark Antony's speech is he kept saying, Brutus is an honorable man. Was he? He was, he was protecting himself legally. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I'm saying Brutus is an honorable man. Yeah, sure. I'd say I'm something sure negative. An honorable man. So the trick that Cicero used, who was the greatest lawyer in Roman history, was he would say, I'm not going to say Brett is an idiot. I'm not going to say he's dumb. I'm not going to say he's offensive. I'm not saying that about Brett. You only said one true thing. Thank you. Okay. So I'm not saying those things about Brett. And that was legal. If you were an attorney, that was legal. But it wouldn't be legal if he didn't say, I'm not saying, if he said the rest of the sentence. So the reason in Mark Antony's speech is you hear him saying, Brutus is an honorable man. Brutus is an honorable man. But you notice it started out, you know, they let me come speak here at the funeral. Brutus is an honorable man. And then it got to be more and more negative. And sure, Brutus is an honorable man. Yeah. And then he gets down to when he gets the people on the side, it was, you know, traitors. Mm -hmm. But then he comes back at the end and says, you know, they're all, they had their reasons. Alas, I know not why they did this. They have their reasons, and they'll let you know. So that is a very important uh, speech in history. That Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar, is a very important uh, history. And that's how people learned history back then, because we didn't have books. We didn't really have schools. And so some people who were educated would write a play that was sort of true and go around and spreading it. And it just so happened to see that uh, uh, Shakespeare was a great writer. And the play caught on. And so the takeaway, you know, the, the takeaway thing for you today is that one of the greatest men in the history of the world was Julius Caesar. And if you can't remember why, just remember that part. And here's the last thing I want you to remember before we take our break. Um, so one of the things about Caesar is, I've, told, I've said this before, is uh, of always acting properly, having control of your emotions. Don't let people control you. So, for example, one time they had, uh, I don't remember where it was, but they, his army had won a war and they were at a banquet and they were celebrating. And the food they were served, the hosts felt it was a delicacy. But the Roman people were not used to that food, so they were complaining, God, this food sucks. How can we eat this crap? No wonder they can't fight. No wonder we beat them. They can't even cook. Uh, and Caesar said, stop. The height of rudeness is to complain about the food. If you don't like it, just don't eat it. And so that's kind of a lesson I think that we should all have is don't complain about stuff like that. Just don't eat it. And let's see, I think not next week, but the week after that, we're going to start with preparing for the Jesuit coming. So how many people were here when the Jesuit came? Okay, a good number. So we're gonna first we do Nancy Cohen, which is about crisis leadership, and then we do Marcus Aurelius. We do uh, Stoicism, and then the third week the Jesuit comes and we learn about uh, that.
Okay, any questions? Okay, break time. Good job today, everyone. Manual, good job.